This prison, known as the Wall for its strength and security, saw a daring escape attempt in 1996. One of the inmates decided it was time to break free, understanding well that such an endeavor required meticulous planning and could not be undertaken alone. He rallied six of his fellow prisoners, forming a team with a diverse set of skills, ready to face the numerous challenges and obstacles that would undoubtedly arise during their escape. In the final phase of their plan, two team members were digging through the escape tunnel when suddenly, the prison alarms went off due to another inmate stabbing the guard. This incident threw the prison into an emergency state, with guards methodically securing prisoners back into their cells. The pressing question was how these two would manage to exit the tunnel undetected under such high security. The inmates' daring actions throughout their escape attempts are abundant in this story's thrilling events. It's a story showcasing the prisoners' quick thinking and intelligence to navigate through their predicaments. So let's dive into the video to uncover the full story. This prison, known as the Western Penitentiary, is located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and stands as one of the oldest correctional facilities in both America and the world. It was constructed in 1882 and closed its doors in 2005, marking a remarkable 123 years of operation. At the time of its inauguration in 1882, it was considered one of the most modern and advanced prisons. It was established with the noble intention of reforming the inmates who entered its walls. However, as over a century passed, it transformed into a place that could only be described as hellish, much like many other American prisons at that time. Known for its formidable security, this prison earned the nickname The Wall, because throughout its more than a century of existence, not a single prisoner managed to escape from its confines. Its exterior resembled a fortified castle, with massive walls made entirely of cement and solid stone, reinforced with iron, and deemed impenetrable. These walls extended three meters underground. Inside, the prison was further secured with multiple internal gates at every cell block and section, complemented by numerous external watchtowers and security systems. One of the inmates, a man named Nuno Pontus, was no ordinary criminal. He was incarcerated for his expertise as a safecracker, specializing in safes and vaults. Whether it was robbing stores, offices, or even homes, Nuno utilized his skills to crack open safes, break them, or open them by some means to steal the contents within. Additionally, he fancied playing Robin Hood, distributing the stolen goods among his family, neighbors, and friends who were poor or in difficult situations. However, the lion's share was always kept to himself, allowing him to indulge in luxury cars, dine at the most expensive restaurants, and visit extravagant places. Throughout his life, Nuno found himself behind bars multiple times, and in 1992, he was sentenced to 15 years in the Western Penitentiary, or the Wall. Nuno observed the prison conditions worsening day by day. The facility was overcrowded, housing inmates well beyond its capacity, and violence among the prisoners escalated. He sometimes witnessed inmates stabbing each other for the most trivial reasons, with some even dying in front of him. Seeing the situation deteriorate to such an extent, Nuno felt he had reached a point where escaping from this place became a necessity. He spent a long time searching for the right opportunity and knew he needed other accomplices to help him with the operation. Finally, in 1996, that opportunity arrived when a new cellmate, Greg Quiring, was transferred to his cell. The two quickly got to know each other and became friends sharing many commonalities and similar personalities. Nuno felt he could trust Greg. Thus, one day, they sat down, and Nuno opened up about the escape plan. Greg was immediately enthusiastic and agreed to join. Together, they brainstormed various escape methods. One initial idea was to demolish a prison wall somehow and escape through it, but they quickly abandoned this idea, realizing that even if they managed to execute it, the escape would be discovered quickly, and they would be recaptured. Another idea was to escape via the construction trucks or vehicles transporting building materials, as the prison was always under maintenance. 
However, the prison administration was vigilant about this possibility, conducting headcounts before any truck left the prison to ensure all inmates were accounted for. Thus, escaping by truck was deemed impossible and dismissed. Their third idea was the classic approach of digging an underground tunnel. The only issue was that throughout the prison's history, many inmates had attempted to escape by tunneling, but none had succeeded. They were always discovered or something went wrong. So Nuno had to think of a way to dig a tunnel and avoid the mistakes made by previous inmates, so they decided to go for this option. The first thing they needed was a third partner with experience in tunneling, as neither he nor Gray had the necessary expertise for this task. Here comes the role of a prisoner named Kevin Billingsley, who was serving a 40-year sentence for various charges, including thefts and armed assaults. Kevin had the expertise Nuno needed. He was a skilled digger and excavator from his previous work in mining. Kevin had also contemplated escaping, but was unsure of where to start, where to dig the tunnel, and where it should lead. That's when Nuno stepped in, persuading him to join their team. Nuno assured him that he would handle the logistics of where to start digging and where to emerge, while Kevin's main responsibility would be to lead the actual digging process. Thus, Kevin also agreed to join the group. Now, Nuno's task now was to pinpoint the digging location within the vast prison. To determine the optimal spot, he needed to explore the prison and its various areas and buildings, which required him to secure a job inside the prison. Prisons often have a system for employing inmates, so Nuno needed a job that would allow him to roam different parts of the prison and scout its layout and facilities. The best position he found that could provide him with this opportunity was in maintenance, a role overseen by the prison engineer. The engineer's office was responsible for the upkeep of plumbing, drainage systems, electrical connections, and ventilation, meaning work extended across all prison areas and sections. Moreover, the engineer's office contained all the prison's blueprints, including every building and section, making it the perfect place for him to work. Indeed, Nuno managed to secure a position in the prison engineer's office or maintenance workshop, granting him access to all maintenance issues within the prison. This role allowed him to gather extensive information on the prison's layout and division system. Of course, this information collection didn't happen overnight. It took several months. During these months, Nuno was constantly on the lookout for the perfect spot from which to start the tunnel. Fortuitously, one day, a maintenance issue arose in the prison's external warehouse. This warehouse, located just outside the prison walls, faced the street but was still considered part of the prison. It controlled the movement of goods and items coming from outside into the prison and sometimes served as a storage space for these items until they were needed within the prison. It was easier to receive and store goods, requiring less security since it was outside the prison. This warehouse building, adjoining the prison walls and directly facing the street, was known by Nuno to be the perfect exit point if they could reach it through the tunnel. They could directly access the street from there, making it the ideal tunnel exit point. Now, knowing where the tunnel should end, Nuno still needed to determine the starting point, preferably as close to the warehouse as possible to minimize the tunnel's length. And once again, luck was on his side because the maintenance building in the prison the one he worked in, which is shown in orange as you see, was directly opposite the external warehouse, which is marked in green. Therefore, the best starting point for the tunnel was the maintenance building where he worked. From here, they could dig a relatively short tunnel directly to the warehouse. But the challenge was how to dig within the same workshop without being discovered. After studying the prison's blueprints, Numo discovered a second room within the same maintenance building. This room had a crawl space beneath it, a gap between the maintenance room's floor and the ground. To clarify, let's refer back to this blueprint. This is the external warehouse they aim to reach, and this is the maintenance building, which is divided into two sections. The section on the right is the maintenance workshop where Nuno works, and the section on the left is a room belonging to the maintenance building. This room, with the crawl space beneath it, is where he planned to start digging the tunnel. 
However, the problem was that this maintenance room, from which they intended to dig the tunnel, was locked, and the only access to it was through a steel door, the key to which was only held by the guards. Therefore, the option of entering through the door was difficult, if not nearly impossible. The second option they had was to breach the walls of the maintenance room. Behind the room, there were walls made of stone brick. If Nuno could break through this wall, he would be able to enter the crawl space beneath the room. The only method that occurred to him to break or smash the wall was to use a drill, which was available in the maintenance workshop. However, he couldn't just take the drill and start working on the wall. He needed to concoct a pretext or excuse. So, he went and broke a water pipe near the maintenance room, the very room whose wall he wanted to drill through. And then he reported the broken pipe he had intentionally damaged. He told the maintenance engineer responsible that he could fix the pipe, and the engineer allowed him to take the necessary tools for the job. One of the tools Nuno took was a drill, but according to prison rules, he had to be accompanied by a guard while working, meaning they wouldn't let him use dangerous tools like a drill without someone watching him. So Nuno went out with the guard and began working on the pipe he had broken himself, with the guard standing behind him in the work area. The workspace was essentially a corridor formed by two walls and a ceiling above. The wall with the broken pipe was on the right, while the wall Nuno intended to breach was on the left. So, there Nuno was working on the pipe with the guard behind him. However, the guard wouldn't stay focused on him and monitor every detail of his work. In the moments when the guard was distracted or looking away, Nuno would swiftly move to the second wall and start working on it drilling into it. Also, the guard wouldn't think much of it, assuming Nuno was just performing his work, so he wouldn't pay much attention. But unfortunately, the drill wasn't powerful enough to effectively penetrate the wall. It was making progress, but it would take an excessively long time. Surely, the guard would realize something was amiss. Thus, Nuno decided to abandon this entire approach. The wall was a dead end, he couldn't breach it. Now, he had to reconsider the entrance he previously deemed impossible. The door. To enter through the door, he would need the key, but how could he possibly get his hands on it, given that it was only held by the guards? So again, the three partners gathered to brainstorm a way to obtain a copy of the key. They needed to find a material that could help them replicate it. So they experimented with different substances that could capture an impression of the key. They tried soap, oatmeal, and finally, styrofoam, the material used in packaging boxes, discovering that it could hold an excellent imprint of the key. Once they had the imprint, they could use the tools available in the maintenance workshop, where Nuno worked, to craft a copper replica. But before all this, how could they get an impression of the key? The plan was to wait by the maintenance room door and monitor a guard during his inspection round. When the guard came to open the door, the last key he used would be the one they needed, positioned at the top of the key ring. Now they knew which key it was, but obviously, they couldn't just snatch the key ring from the guard that easily. What Nuno did was pay two inmates to start a fight among themselves. As soon as the two inmates clashed, the guard had to intervene. While the guard was occupied breaking up the fight between the two prisoners, Nuno slipped behind him and within seconds was able to press the key into a piece of styrofoam he had with him. Nuno hadn't expected the process to go so smoothly and easily. He managed to capture the key's imprint and move away from the guard without being noticed. After a few days, they were able to create a replica of the key from this imprint. When the key was ready, they decided to try it on the door. The trial had to be either during their work period or during their outdoor recreation time, which was limited and when guards were scattered everywhere. Just trying the key was a risk, especially since one of the watchtowers overlooked the door. Although it was a distance away, the guard in the watchtower could see them if he looked in their direction, not to mention the guards on the ground. Nuno and Greg went to the maintenance room door Greg kept watch for any approaching guards while Nuno inserted the key into the lock and attempted to turn it. However, unfortunately, the key broke inside the lock. 
It was too thin and weak, and it snapped almost immediately upon turning in the lock. Now the broken piece of the key was stuck inside the lock, and Nuno and his partner didn't know what to do. They feared the guards would notice them, and if they left the broken key in the lock, the guards would discover it during their inspection rounds. This could trigger a prison-wide emergency and ruin their entire plan, so they needed to remove the broken key from the lock, and the only way to do so was to use tools from the maintenance workshop where Nuno worked, which was close by. Nuno quickly ran from the maintenance room door to the workshop behind the building. This workshop, where he worked, contained many tools, but the cabinets and drawers storing these tools were locked. However, Nuno had planned for this and had copied the keys to the workshop door and the cabinets and drawers as well, allowing him to open the workshop door and take any tool he needed at any time. Nuno grabbed a pair of pliers and rushed from the workshop back to the door of the maintenance room. Quickly, he started working to extract the broken key from the lock while Greg watched the area. After several attempts, Nuno managed to remove the broken piece of the key. Miraculously, all of this happened without any guards noticing them. Nuno then immediately returned the pliers to the workshop, and they quickly left the area to regroup. The first key attempt had failed, but the idea of the key itself was still viable. They still had the imprint, and all they needed to do was create a new, stronger version of the key. After a few days of work, they managed to make a new key. This time, when they tried it, they were able to open the door, and finally, after all their effort, they gained access to the coveted room. Inside this room, there was a small metal gate. This gate led them to the crawl space, from which they would start digging the tunnel. But before they began the digging process, Nuno came up with a clever idea aimed at distracting the guards. Nuno's idea was for him and his partners to start brewing alcohol inside the prison. The details of how they managed to produce alcohol within the confines of the prison weren't disclosed, but it seems they were able to produce significant quantities and distribute them among the inmates in the prison yard. In this way, they diverted the guards' focus, which became entirely dedicated to uncovering and stopping the brewing and distribution of alcohol. Unaware that this entire operation was merely a cover for the real operation the three inmates were executing, digging a tunnel from underneath the maintenance room. However, as the digging operations began, challenges started to emerge. The first challenge was the guards' inspections. On one occasion, Nuno was returning to his cell after an outdoor recreation period, and there was always a guard stationed at the dormitory gate. Sometimes, this guard would search the inmates as they came back in. The guard stopped him at the door for a search. The problem was that Nuno had keys in his pocket, including the key to the maintenance room they were digging under. However, inmates working in maintenance, like Nuno, were allowed to carry certain keys. The concern was that the guard might notice the extra key. But to avoid raising suspicion, as soon as the guard stopped him for the search, Nuno confidently handed over all his keys to the guard without trying to hide them or distract attention from them. He knew that the best way to get through this situation was to hand over the keys confidently. He essentially handed the guard the key to his freedom. Yet the guard, after finishing the search and finding nothing amiss, returned the keys and allowed him to enter his cell as usual. But their challenges didn't end there. Their partner, Greg, who shared a cell with Nuno and was responsible for distributing the homemade alcohol among the inmates, a diversion to distract the guards, got caught. The plan to distract the guards with the alcohol brewing and distribution operation backfired on them, or on Greg specifically. Greg was placed in solitary confinement as a result of this incident. He might have been released after a while to rejoin the tunnel digging operation, but at some point, Greg apparently lost his cool and attempted to attack one of the guards. This led to an extension of his solitary confinement for several months, effectively removing Greg from the operation, since he would no longer be able to participate with them, leaving only Nuno and Kevin to continue working on the tunnel. Kevin, with his expertise, led the drilling operation, teaching, and guiding Nuno on how to dig the tunnel. They took turns digging, working together to advance the tunnel. 
Every time one of them entered the room to dig, the other had to lock the door behind him because if they left the door open, the guards would notice and their plan would be exposed. So one would enter, and they agreed on a specific period during which he would dig, and after the time was up, his partner would come back and open the door for him. The digging process was far from easy. Their digging tool was just pieces of wood, and they had a small bucket to carry out the dirt from the tunnel. They also had helmets with lights stolen from one of the prison buildings. The digging became even more challenging because the soil was almost like mud, given that the prison was built on a riverbank with a river directly in front of the prison. The muddy soil meant they had to dig through with wooden pieces and haul out heaps of mud in the bucket, dumping it in the crawl space above. Despite the relatively short distance of the tunnel, it required a lot of work, especially since it had to be deep to bypass the prison walls that extended three meters underground. The tunnel needed to be dug at least four meters deep to get past the wall, a depth they knew from the blueprints available in the maintenance workshop. Besides the depth, they also faced a significant horizontal distance, needing to dig about 12 meters. Estimates suggested they had to remove around 15 tons of soil or mud to make the tunnel, and aside from the tremendous effort required, there were numerous risks involved. The first was the potential collapse of the tunnel, especially since they had nothing to support it. Additionally, trucks passing on the road above them shook the ground not directly over the tunnel but close by, since they were near the external warehouse facing the street, which received many goods for the prison. These passing trucks added to the risk of the tunnel collapsing. Moreover, the deeper and further they dug, the less oxygen there was, making breathing more difficult. They had no ventilation system and no way to create one, forcing them to dig or work in the tunnel for a bit before having to exit to catch their breath. Despite these risks, the work was slow but steady. Nuno and Kevin discussed the possibility of adding more members to the team to reduce the workload and speed up the digging. However, before they could think about who to add to their group, one of the inmates began to suspect them. He had been watching them and noticed their daily entries and exits from the locked maintenance room. However, this inmate, named Carmen Keller, wanted to be part of the operation. Carmen was serving a life sentence for second-degree murder, a type of crime in American law that can be unintentional, such as vehicular homicide due to reckless driving or a killing in a moment of drunkenness or rage, indicating that the crime wasn't premeditated. When he started confronting Nuno and Kevin, expressing his suspicions, they felt compelled to include him in their group. Nuno was hesitant to bring him on board, but felt forced to do so since Carmen had become aware of their plan and could potentially expose them. Thus, the group expanded to three. Nuno, Kevin, and now Carmen. Although Carmen essentially imposed himself on them, his inclusion brought an additional benefit beyond just another pair of hands for digging. Carmen worked in the prison's education and rehabilitation department, which granted him certain privileges that could aid their escape effort. One key privilege was his ability to access most areas of the prison freely without raising suspicion, providing him with more time and opportunity for digging. Additionally, part of his job allowed him to issue passes for other inmates to leave their cells or work areas if needed. So, Carmen joining the group was more advantageous than merely having an extra person to assist with the digging. During this time, Nuno started to plan for after their escape, realizing they would need a vehicle to take them away from the prison area once they emerged from the tunnel. Unfortunately, none of them, including their associates, knew anyone outside the prison who could assist them. For this reason, Nuno decided to recruit a fourth member to their group, someone with connections outside the prison who could potentially provide a car or help them escape. Here comes the new member of the group, an old man named George Kennard. Kennard was a convicted murderer serving a life sentence and hailing from Pittsburgh, the same city where the prison was located. He had connections that could supposedly provide a car for their escape after they broke out of prison. They added the old George to the group solely for his ability to secure someone who could bring them a car. George wasn't expected to dig with them due to his age. The three capable of digging, Nuno, 
Kevin and Carmen intensified their shifts to finish faster. Nuno and Carmen could dig in the morning due to their work schedules and job nature, while Kevin was only able to dig during the afternoon and early evening when the inmates were out for their outdoor recreation time. After about a month of continuous work, they managed to dig to a depth of 4 meters and horizontally for about 9 meters, placing them directly underneath the prison wall according to the blueprints. They were close to completing their task, but there was always the risk of being discovered at any moment. And indeed, disaster struck one day in December 1996. Nuno, along with Kevin and Carmen, went to the maintenance room. Kevin and Carmen entered to continue the digging, and Nuno closed the door behind them before heading to the prison's dining hall to eat. Suddenly, while he was eating, the prison alarms went off, and the guards ordered all inmates to immediately return to their cells. The cause was that an inmate had stabbed two guards. An incident like this immediately triggered a state of emergency in the prison, requiring all inmates to return to their cells for a headcount and search. The problem was that Kevin and Carmen were locked in the maintenance room, digging the tunnel, while Nuno and all the other inmates were ordered to return to their cells. Nuno needed to think quickly about how to get his partners out because if he couldn't, their plan would be exposed, resulting in increased sentences and long-term solitary confinement for all of them. As the guards began rounding up the inmates to take them back to their cells, Nuno, standing in line to enter his dormitory, asked two inmates to start a fight, promising them a reward. While the guard was distracted from breaking up the fight, Nuno took the opportunity to slip away from the coup and ran to the maintenance room to free his friends. Nuno had no choice but to take a chance because the prison was in emergency mode and there was a high likelihood that a guard would see him. He quickly opened the maintenance room door, went straight to the crawl space, and upon reaching the tunnel entrance, found Kevin and Carmen preparing to exit because they had heard the alarms and realized something was happening. They were almost out of the tunnel, a fortunate circumstance since entering and exiting a tunnel of that depth and length was no easy feat. Nuno hurriedly told them they needed to leave the room. Kevin and Carmen quickly dressed and left the area, and fortunately, no guards were present in the vicinity. Each of the three managed to return to their cells swiftly without arousing any suspicion, miraculously avoiding the disaster that could have befallen them. This incident significantly strengthened the bond and relationship between the four inmates, motivating them to dig the tunnel faster. All members of the group became more willing to follow any instructions given by Nuno, whom they truly saw as a leader, because he didn't abandon them during a critical moment. Instead, he risked his safety to save them and the operation, knowing that completing the tunnel was just a matter of time. Now their focus needed to shift to the post-escape plan. Old George was supposed to arrange for someone to provide a car outside the prison, but he failed to fulfill this task, even though it was his only task, as he wasn't even involved in the digging. Consequently, Nuno had to find an alternative solution. The idea that came to mind was to steal a car after escaping from prison. However, none of them had experience in this area, so they needed to find a new inmate with expertise in car theft to join them. So they added a new member, Andrew Hain, a car thief serving 10 years for thefts and assaults. With Andrew's inclusion, the number of group members increased to five. Andrew joined towards the end of the tunnel digging, but his primary role would come into play after they emerged from the tunnel. This meant he would contribute significantly to the operation and play an essential role, even if he wasn't involved in the digging. Surprisingly, Andrew wasn't the last addition to the team. A sixth member was soon to join them. This member was another elderly man named Thomas. Thomas's inclusion in the team didn't offer any strategic benefit. Numo brought him into the fold simply because they were close friends. Thomas was an old man suffering from deteriorating health, including significant vision problems that could potentially lead to blindness. Numo included him out of compassion, and the rest of the team did not object, seeing Nuno as their leader and trusting his decisions. This brought the group's membership to six as they prepared for the final stages of their escape plan from the prison. 
The tunnel had reached its horizontal endpoint. What remained was to dig upwards to reach the floor of the external warehouse. The most challenging phase of tunnel digging, because it involved digging above oneself. A misstep could cause the soil to collapse, potentially burying the digger alive. Understandably, none of the team members were eager to undertake this risky venture. No one wanted to dig above their heads except Nuno, who stepped forward to take on the task, solidifying his position as the leader. Digging upwards at the end of the tunnel was fraught with danger, but was expected to be quick. As the soil and mud were dislodged, they would fall under the force of gravity, making it possible to remove them with the bucket they had. Gradually, Nuno began to strike at the soil and mud above him, causing it to fall, and quickly managed to climb and dig through the four meters until the last pile of soil fell through, bringing with it a fresh gust of air, a breath of oxygen from above that made breathing easier in the tunnel. However, the exit was not yet open. They faced the last hurdle, the warehouse's reinforced steel floor. Breaking through this barrier would be one of their most challenging tasks. To breach a reinforced concrete floor, heavy-duty tools were necessary. Nuno, aware of this, had previously made copies of the keys to the maintenance workshop, along with its cabinets and drawers full of tools. His familiarity with the workshop was crucial, as it was his workplace. But typically, he wasn't permitted to access it at will especially not to take tools for such an unauthorized purpose. Nuno entered the workshop and took a large drill and a hydraulic jack, the type used for lifting cars, along with other essential tools, back to the tunnel. Together, they drilled several holes in different areas of the concrete floor, aiming to weaken it. The drill wasn't enough to break through the concrete entirely, and here the hydraulic jack came into play. They dug a spot for the jack, placed it against the concrete floor, and pressed it until it broke. The concrete crumbled under pressure, opening a hole above them. However, the steel reinforcement bars remained, requiring them to bring an electric saw from the workshop specialized for cutting steel bars. Cutting these bars fully opened the tunnel exit, enabling them to access the external warehouse. The room they emerged into was used for mechanical work, seldom utilized, and situated at the far end of the warehouse, away from usual worker and staff areas, making it an ideal exit point without raising suspicion. The exit hatch was ready, but they had to wait until the next day to escape, a risky but necessary delay, hoping it wouldn't be discovered. The best time for escape was after dawn, as evening roll calls and locked doors prevented them from leaving their cells after evening. Carmen Keller's position in the prison's education and rehabilitation department allowed him to issue permits for them to leave their cells early. These permits were usually for specific tasks or appointments within the education department, playing a significant role in their escape plan. That night, the six remained in their cells, filled with anticipation and anxiety, with Nuno unable to sleep. The following morning, January 8, 1997, they initiated their escape plan after 6 a.m., using the permits distributed by Carmen to leave their cells under the guise of going to assign tasks. However, their actual destination was the maintenance room and the tunnel. They had to move quickly, as the morning inmate count at 10 a.m. would reveal their absence. They needed every minute to distance themselves as much as possible from the prison. The six of them reached the maintenance room, entered together, closed the door behind them, and decided that Kevin would enter the tunnel first, with Nuno going last. They positioned the elderly and Andrew, the car thief, in the middle since this was their first time entering the tunnel, positioning them there to assist in case any issues arose. Navigating the tunnel was a challenge in itself, especially for the elderly and particularly for Thomas, whom they had included out of pity due to his frail health and poor vision making the passage through the tunnel notably difficult for him. Indeed, they encountered some difficulties with the elderly during the crossing, causing delays. However, after some effort and mutual assistance, they managed to emerge on the other side, one by one. The first thing they did was change out of their prison uniforms into civilian clothes. Remarkably, at that time, 
The prison allowed inmates to keep personal clothing besides their prison garments, a policy that was part of prisoners' rights laws likely unique to that state at the time. Emerging from the tunnel with their clothes, they quickly changed into their civilian attire by around 7.30 a.m., leaving them with about two and a half hours before the inmate count at 10 o'clock a.m. now. They needed to figure out how to exit the warehouse undetected. The door of the room they were in led directly to the street, but the issue was a watchtower located directly above the gate they intended to use for their exit, with the guard likely to see them. Nuno had anticipated this as well and brought along worker helmets stolen from inside the prison. Each of them put on a helmet, and the plan was to pretend they were workers leaving the warehouse. At this point, they were technically outside the prison, so the guard shouldn't assume they were coming from inside, especially if their attire matched that of workers. Emerging from the side door of the warehouse, the six walked out confidently, with one of them even nodding and greeting the guard who returned the greeting. They passed right in front of the guard, who acknowledged them. The immediate task after getting a safe distance from the prison was to steal a car. Andrew, the car thief, managed to open a car door, and with his expertise, he started the car by hot wiring it. They all got into the car and began to distance themselves from the prison, heading straight for Texas. Nuno had contacts in Texas who could potentially arrange for forged identities for them. By 10 a.m., when the prison conducted its daily inmate count, the guards realized the six inmates were missing and immediately alerted the police and security authorities, who began a search around the prison area. However, unbeknownst to them, the inmates had already been on the road for over two hours, putting a considerable distance, over 200 kilometers, between themselves and the prison. The newspapers and media published articles about the grand escape the following day, featuring photos and the names of the inmates. Nuno's plan was for them to first head to Texas and from there to Mexico before moving on to a South American country. They successfully reached their first destination, Texas, marking the beginning of their journey towards freedom and evading capture. Now, to move from Texas to Mexico, they needed to cross the border, which meant they had to secure forged identities for themselves. Nuno had contacts in the state and knew someone who could arrange for these forged documents, but the process would take some time. He reached out to this acquaintance, initiating the process of creating the fake IDs. During the waiting period, the six inmates stayed in a secluded hotel in Texas, which was barely a hotel by standard definitions, but the important thing was that it offered a place where they could stay and sleep. By January 14, 1997, six days had elapsed since the escape, and the police were still searching for them without any leads on their whereabouts. However, on that day, the police received a tip from a relative of Thomas, the elderly inmate with health issues. The relative informed the police that Thomas had been admitted to a hospital in Texas, providing the first clue to the authorities that the escapees were likely in Texas. Thomas had a methamphetamine addiction issue. It seems he relapsed and used the drug while they were at the hotel, worsening his health condition. This led to a heated argument between Nuno and Thomas about drug use under their precarious circumstances. Following the dispute, Thomas decided to leave the group. After leaving the hotel, it appears he went unconscious on the street, was picked up by an ambulance, and was taken to the hospital. His family was then informed, leading his relative to contact the police with this information. With this lead, the police issued a statewide alert for the escapees in Texas, believing they were still together. They intensified patrols and search operations throughout Texas, hoping to locate the group based on the assumption that they had remained together. And by January 18, 1997, 10 days had passed since the escape, and Nuno and his companions were still waiting for their forged identities. That day, Carmen and Nuno went out for a drive when a patrol car spotted them and attempted to pull them over. However, they didn't comply with the police order, and Carmen, who was driving, accelerated, leading to a police chase through the streets. Eventually, Carmen stopped the car near a forest, and both he and Nuno fled on foot. 
The police managed to catch Carmen, but Nuno successfully escaped, weaving through the trees. Nuno remained at large, hiding in the forests for two full days. After ensuring the police had lost his trail, he decided to return to the hotel, where he found his anxious friends waiting, unaware of the events that had unfolded. Nuno informed them that Carmen had been captured. Faced with a dilemma about whether to leave the area or stay, they decided to remain in the same city to wait for their forged identities, which they had been anticipating for days. However, they planned to move to a new hotel to avoid detection. Unbeknownst to them, Carmen, now in police custody, betrayed them by informing the police of their hotel location. Fortunately, by the time the police acted on Carmen's tip, the group had already moved to a new hotel, though they stayed within the same city and state of Texas, still waiting for their forged documents. Under pressure from the police, Carmen divulged more information, revealing the identity of the individual they were communicating with regarding the forged documents. He provided the police with the man's name and description, enabling them to track him down and monitor his movements closely. As this contact was preparing to deliver the forged identities, he headed to the hotel to meet Nuno and his associates. However, unaware of the police tailing him, his arrival at the new hotel led to a dramatic police and SWAT team encirclement of the premises. They stormed the hotel, entered the room where Nuno and his companions were staying, and arrested them all. Thus, the six inmates' adventure concluded on January 20, 1997, after only 12 days of freedom. Despite months of planning and effort, they only enjoy a brief period of liberty before facing severe repercussions. The punishments meted out were harsher than expected, serving as a stark example of retribution. Although their sentences were not significantly extended, for instance, Nuno was placed in solitary confinement for 14 years, spending 23 hours a day in his cell with only one hour outside. This severe punishment was far beyond what might have been deemed appropriate. This concludes the story, a tale of meticulous planning, brief freedom, and harsh consequences. If you found this story intriguing, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, activate the notification bell, and check out our previous exciting stories.